everyone, today we're talking about course outlines and I've been really fortunate to work on some projects with our partners with the um, Skills to Access the Green Economy project with uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada and we have been uh, taking the time over the past uh, few weeks to look at the existing curriculum and going through the course outlines using our best practices for CBET or competency-based education and training and using those taxonomy uh, strategies that we did with Bloom's taxonomy and the rigor re relevance frameworks. We've been going through and taking a look at the existing course outlines and doing revisions to upgrade them for better CBET uh, implementation. So we'll jump over to the PowerPoint here and walk through uh, some of that course outline process together. And we're onto the PowerPoint here. And so we're talking about better course outlines. Over the past couple of videos, we've been talking about curriculum design in competency-based education and training programs, CBET programs. And so today we're going to talk about how do we go about designing those course outlines. In the previous video, and I, if you haven't watched it yet, do take that time to go through that content. But we talked about the importance of occupational task assessment or occupational task analysis, where you go through and through a, an iterative process using a wide variety of different investigation methods, you go through and investigate what is it that's important in the classroom to give a good student experience? What is it that industry needs skill-wise for workers to be successful in the workplace? And what is it um, from a visioning perspective that is important for the success of the industry, whether that's through employability skills or whether that's through innovation of minds and innovation of the skills and the expectation of skills. So uh, do take the time to watch that video if you haven't, because I'm gonna make the assumption you have and you've started building of that occupational task assessment so that you know what are those core themes and those core topics that need to be covered in your course. And I love this photo of this, uh, a great group of people. Um, and we've got there in the center, my good friend, uh, Sabjit Bamra, who is a professor at Niagara College. And you've got Jamie and Michael and Emily and Audra. We've got Nathan and we've got Rachel. And they were such a great group of students. Um, we at Niagara College are big on experiential learning and trying to get out into the workplace as much as possible or bringing work integrated learning into the classroom as part of our CBED experience. And so I, I realize this is pre-COVID, but uh, we're really looking forward to getting back to that sort of scenario. So what does the quality course outline help you do? It informs your curriculum and class content, and it also is part of a CBET uh, framework. It defines the measurable outcomes for your course. And so I always, I always... I realize the taxonomy on that verb do is pretty low, but at the end of this course, you will be able to do these sorts of skills. And using active verbs from those uh, Bloom's taxonomy or whether you're focused on affective or psychomotor domains, you're picking the right verbs to describe what people are doing. And you're thinking very deliberately about the wording so that you um, are both giving enough detail about the tasks and the skills that you need your students to be able to do while still being broad enough that you give some leeway to the instructor to have a bit of creative license. Because inevitably, I, I always use the example of a pH meter. We want our students in food science to be able to measure pH in a food product. Do you back it out so that you are saying, I would like students to be able to do food analysis? Or do you say, I would like students to be able to use pH meter XYZ, model 14? It has to be somewhere in that middle where you stress the importance of measuring pH, but not so detailed that it's going to limit any sort of options and not so broad that it leaves everything open to interpretation. So it has to be in that space where it's uh, measurable outcomes for that course. A good course outline is going to help direct how your content is going to be evaluated as well. In those active verbs, it's going to help you 
figure out what is that level of performance that the student needs to be able to demonstrate. So for example, if you want the students to be able to create a new food product, you are likely not going to be doing multiple choice exams. You are likely going to give the students some sort of open-ended project where they go through and develop a new food product. So that evaluation is linked to those verbs as well. So again, uh, that bottom bullet point here, it, using taxonomy is going to define how the activities are done. It's going to define that level of thinking and that rigor relevance as we talked about before. So let's jump out here. And just a quick reminder, we talked about Bloom's taxonomy and the fact that we are focused as much as possible in CBA education on higher order thinking skills. And so while there is an importance for lower order thinking skills, remembering and understanding, usually in CBA we try as fast as possible to start at the application phase because we are, we are assuming that they're going to be doing these other lower order thinking skills in, in tandem at the same time as they're doing that application. And so we, we use appropriate rigor relevance in our wording, but jump to the application phase as fast as possible in CBET. This is, just happens to be a verb chart from globaldigitalcitizen.org and their foundation. And again, there are verb charts available. If you Google um, learning taxonomy verb charts or Bloom's taxonomy verb charts, these are quite accessible and, and again, having one of these verb charts available and open and often, I, 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 some of my friends who are in curriculum design, they'll have a poster on the wall of their office that they can quickly, um, quickly glance at as they're going about thinking about the taxonomies that they're working on. But again, working towards those verbs um, in the higher order as fast as possible is going to help define what those tasks are going to be. And again, uh, just a, a reminder too about that rigor relevance framework that I mentioned this before, that sometimes I don't want people to be fixated on this taxonomy saying, well, um, early courses earlier on in the semester need, to, or earlier on in the program of instruction need to be low taxonomy and courses at the end need to be high taxonomy. That's often true because again, that progression of skills towards mastery tends to lead that way. But sometimes, sometimes it's not necessary to have a huge amount of um, mastery of a skill set. Sometimes it's just important to be aware that that, that skill is there and that, that criticality of awareness and knowledge is important, but not a mastery of the skill set. Uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, I often use the example of when you're teaching management courses, you don't need you you don't need a manager who's overseeing engineers to be a, uh, to be a specialist engineer. It's it's helpful, but they need to be aware of some of those engineering concepts and be able to leverage the technical expertise of the the, the technical specialists that they're managing, and so. That's, a, that's one example where they need to be aware of certain circumstances. Similar, it, when teaching management courses, you don't necessarily need to be a legal specialist, but you need to have an awareness of the laws that are out there and know when to uh, liaise with lawyers or other um, members of the uh, regulatory or compliance environment to be able to justify the type of work that you're doing. So. While these taxonomies are intended to be formative and help with that curriculum, you do need to think with, a, a, I want to say, use your critical thinking skills as, as part of this to say, where in this taxonomy does that skill need to be? And be ready to justify why you're positioning the different verbs that you are. This is an example of us doing uh, one of these curriculum design experiences and you can see just how we went through that brainstorming process and we, we then listed out all sorts of different tasks that food scientists would be doing. Um, this was from the Vietnam Skills for Employment Project and my, my good mentors and friends, uh, Bev Davies and John Grizzla were uh, helping train um, me and the team in this process. And we can see our friend Kyla Penny down here um, Lots of amazing people and amazing educators in food science in this picture. And 
a lot of brain power going into developing all of these different occupational tasks. So we went through and sequentially listed out, here are some tasks that food and that food processing workers are going to be doing. We then clustered them into themes um, so that we could then start to break those themes down into um, elements of performance within a class. And then we go through a prioritization exercise to say, how much time do we think it is necessary to teach this task? How critical is it that we teach this task? If we don't teach this task well, will this cause a disaster either to human health or the viability of a company if we don't teach it properly? And so that sort of critical thinking goes into uh, that brainstorming process on the front end. So we start off with a bit of a course description. So oftentimes when you're doing curriculum design, you're starting to build out what, what are those top level themes? And then you'll write out a course description. And then it's almost like a, a, a bit of a, a tree diagram. You're going to break it down into some higher level learning outcomes. And then these course learning objectives or elements of performance, which is another term that's uh, used sometimes interchangeably with this. But we're starting high level. This is what that course needs to accomplish. We're then breaking it down into some main key tasks, and then we're breaking it down into those more granular tasks. And on any course, you have to be aware how many credit hours, how much time you have in the classroom to help prioritize how many of these course learning objectives you're able to accomplish in that time. So let's just break it down. Oh, and oh, 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 I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, you do need to be aware that you also want to integrate in those essential employability skills. And so things like emotional intelligences or um, affective domain um, aspects. These are the essential employability skills published by the Conference Board of Canada. And so we've got communication, numeracy, critical thinking, problem solving, information management, interpersonal skills, and personal skills. And thinking about what are those other key transferable skills that enhance employability are also important to not forget when doing this design process. So, oh, I'm just summarizing those. So I, I actually want to walk through one of the course descriptions that I wrote years ago. And then I actually want to go through a brainstorming exercise together with, with you, my wonderful YouTube uh, viewers to show you the sorts of continuous improvement. Oh. <laughs> God bless Outlook. That makes a horrible noise, doesn't it? Um, but let's walk through uh, doing a continuous improvement process on one of the courses that I wrote years ago and see what we can do to improve it. So this course outline, let me, let me just read it for you. This course introduces food chemistry principles focusing on the chemistry of macronutrients and minor constituents in food systems. Integrated into the study will be basic inorganic, organic, and biochemistry topics specifically related to food. So, so far we haven't said anything CBET-wise. Again, I wrote this course outline before I was trained in CBET. Laboratory exercises will include qualitative and quantitative food chemistry incorporating best practices for chemical safety and experiment management. Learning outcomes are correlated to the Research Chefs Association Institute of Food Technology Educational Guidelines. So something, uh, let's just uh, give a little bit of feedback here. I did go to some occupational standards that had been published by the Research Chefs Association and IFT. They did have some... Um, occupational um, standards, voluntary occupational standards, but they said, here's what we want chemistry students to know if they're going to be working in food product development or food science. And no, uh, there's, there's, there's no taxonomy of learning in this, um, and it's really not competency focused. And I'm critiquing it because I wrote it. <laughs> and I can be hard on myself. But let's let's go through and walk through a CBET conversion process on this course description together. So again, reminding ourselves we need to think about how quickly can we jump into this application, analysis, evaluation, and creation phase. And reminding ourselves too that this is a um, level one food chemistry course. So let's see where I took this. Chemistry seals are essential for food quality assurance product development, and food safety evaluations in the manufacturing environment. In this course, you will apply. Oh, now we've got some taxonomy verbs. And we're, we're saying what this student will be able to do at the end of this course. You will apply the basic skills to work safely and effectively in the food chemistry lab. 
You will apply skills to work safely and apply regulatory requirements for occupational health and safety in the chemistry lab environment. You will demonstrate skills for basic quality assurance activities and interpret data from experiments. So this now is competency focused. So first and foremost, we wanted to focus on the fact that working safely in the food chemistry environment, it, it's, a, it's a highly regulated environment in Canada with WIMIS, with um, Global Harmonized System. We want to make sure that people are working safely first and then working accurately. And so we're demonstrating basic quality assurance activities because, again, this is a semester one course where our students are entering into their post-secondary training and this is their first introduction to chemistry and uh, reminding ourselves too from a rigor, uh, not from a rigor relevance, but uh, an archetypal student. Who is that student entering into our programs? Originally, it was mostly high school students who were coming to us with perhaps one or two courses in, high, uh, in um, grade 12 high school science. So we wanted to walk them in progressively into the chemistry environment. But what we found was our archetypal students were actually a mixture of that high school student along with a larger percentage uh, over time of people coming back from the food service industry. And so they were chefs or restaurant servers, cooks, people who had been involved in food service who were upgrading their skills in food technology. And so we needed to be very deliberate about, first and foremost, people working safely, and then secondly, demonstrating some quality assurance activities. Because who was that archetypal worker? If people stopped the program at this point, in many cases they were going on to be um, line operators in food manufacturing, and they would be often involved in some basic quality assurance. So things like monitoring pH, monitoring temperature, monitoring moisture content, doing colorimetry, um, obtaining samples from a line, and so on. So we focused on that archetype, both of the incoming student and who might that, or where might that student be if they were to leave the program at this point. So from there, as you, re as you remember in our diagram, we were breaking it down into steps. So we have a, a top level course description. Now we're going to break it down into that second level of what are the learning outcomes within this course. So our co old course, oh, let's look at those taxonomies. Understand. Oh my gosh, Amy. <laughs> I, as a reminder, I had not been trained in CBET at this point. So understand the chemistry. Well, that doesn't say anything. So, uh, and if you also take a look at this line, is way too broad. Understand the chemistry and biochemistry of major components of foods. Well, admittedly, this was something that was, um, I want to say, iterated from either the Research Chefs Association or from IFT's um, occupational standard for their accreditation, but understand the chemistry and biochemistry of major components. Of, that's huge. That, that, that in its own right could be its own course. It's way too broad and the taxonomy is too low. We need to break this down into something that's much more meaningful. And so again, CBET needs to be actionable towards the workplace. So let's instead hone this in on Oh, gee whiz, this, the, the, the top two lines are copied twice. <laughs> Develop comprehension and skills in general, inorganic and organic. This, this feels like a repetition of the first line. Develop skills to function safely and effectively in the food chemistry and analysis laboratory. This one we, we did see was going to be important. In, understand the role of food chemistry in food perceptions by the public. I actually like this one. This is an affective domain. This is understanding how consumers are reflecting on food chemistry. And as you know very well, that there's a lot of controversy by uninformed consumers that chemistry is bad and food, that if there's chemicals in our food, that's bad. But I'm like, everything is a chemical. <laughs> so we've got to be, we've got to be preparing people to have the leadership and to have the, the fortitude to be working in a field that is misinterpreted by the general public and understand government systems that regulate food chemistry and food safety we actually decided uh, this actually belonged better in another course on food regulations and then we have a we have a follow-up course that's specifically about functional ingredients and additives that digs into more about um, 
some of the fine chemicals that are used as functional additives in food products. So these are the old learning outcomes, and we found lots of critiques that we can do to improve against this. So it's way too expansive. The taxonomy is vague. It's variable. The course learning outcomes are based off of old competency frameworks, which at the, uh, admittedly now they're outdated. Um, and so we have better understanding of occupational standards for quality assurance technicians. Because again, from a tech, uh, from a archetype perspective, who is that student coming in? It's not necessarily someone with a science background. So jumping into organic chemistry right away is not a good idea. Two, who is that QA technician? They're using chemistry and applying chemistry, but not necessarily having to, uh, for example, if they're measuring pH, do they need to know the Nernst equation and be able to understand how um, hydronium ions pass through a semi-permeable membrane to change the electro uh, electrical potential within uh, a pH meter? No, they need to know how to follow an operating procedure for a pH meter, how to calibrate a pH meter, and how to make measurements on a variety of different food products on a variety of different pH meters. That's really what's important for a quality assurance technician. So we jumped out and, and rewrote the new course learning outcomes, again, at that higher level, uh, apply best practices of Canadian and Ontario occupational health and safety legislation for working in a chemistry lab. So we got the students their women's training. We un we walked them through understanding the uh, material data, data safety sheets, uh, MSDSs. So um, we, what else do we do? We do a lot of uh, site-specific training so that they understand the role and function of PPE and how to use a variety of different safety equipment in the chemistry lab. So now they are in a good application phase for working as a, as, a, as a laboratory technician. Then we're demonstrating fundamental lab skills for routine analysis of food products. So at this point, we're focused on routine analysis. So moisture content, pH, water activity, some basic spectrophotometry, some basic titration. I'm already leading you down into some of those granular details uh, because, again, this is the mid-tier of that, of that tier, er, tree diagram. Experiment. Oh, this is a higher taxonomy verb, but that's good. We do need to progress to that. So we're experimenting on a variety of foods to perform routine quality food measures. So again, we're focused on, within that rigor relevance, on routine and expected types of analysis. So lower, lower rigor, but um, we've got good taxonomy here. And we're interpreting data from chemical analyses using appropriate mathematics and computer applications. So now we're doing things like, can the students do some mean standard deviation? Um, can they understand the role of doing replicates or triplicates or uh, the difference between uh, repeats versus replicates in a uh, laboratory analysis? Do they know how to do a standard curve and do a regression analysis on that standard curve. These are some of the basic um, mathematical and computer type applications that a quality assurance technician might be doing. And now, and now we've got clear taxonomy and we've got a clear progression of skills that is relevant to that archetypal student and that archetypal worker. So now we're jumping down to those course learning objectives or elements of performance. So. If we take that high level, now we're going to break it down into, again, more granular tasks. These granular tasks now are what we are going to be doing in terms of converting this over into curriculum. So this is important. We are going to think now with our, with our um, educators' lens, how does this look in the classroom? So practice the basic rights of workers within the o Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act. So workers must follow instructions, they, they must use appropriate PPE when required by an employer, they do have the right to refuse unsafe work. So these are some of those rights that they have, and we want to make sure that they understand those. And, and, and honestly, teaching this early on has been informative. Many of our students go on to work in different workplaces, and oftentimes if they're in startups, they may be the leader in that group and need to... Uh, this almost borders on affective domain. They may be in that leadership position where they have to say to an employer, wait a second, what we're doing is not safe, we need to stop. And that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of fortitude. Do Perform site-specific orientation and risk assessment for working in the chemistry lab. So 
doing things like, for example, if you're doing a sock slit on fat, have you read the MSDS related to hexanes? Have you um, identified what the PPE is necessary to work safely? Are you using appropriate um, preventive controls within the workplace, such as working in the fume hood? So these sorts of site-specific orientation, the, the, oh, pardon me, um, these are really, now we are really focused on what those occupational tasks are. Interpret essential information from women's documentation that would include MSDS and regulations. So the students, for example, might receive a box and see a transportation of dangerous goods stamp on that box. Do they understand what that means and then know how to handle that material properly? Can they read a, uh, the women's documentation uh, on the MSDS and know what's necessary? Do they know about workplace labels versus supplier labels and label their samples appropriately so that they're not putting their um, employees or their colleagues at risk from the activities that they're doing in the chemical lab. Jumping out to that second one, demonstrate fundamental lab skills for routine analysis of food. Well, um, now we're interpreting standard operating procedures for basic food analysis, so we'll give them a variety of different protocols, often from Health Canada's um, compendium of methods, so that they can understand what's going on. Or, or perhaps it's a it's a manual from a manu or, uh, an equipment supplier saying here's how you are um, operating this piece of equipment and see if they can interpret it properly under the application. Can they select relevant lab materials and equipment for performing analysis so they can, can they pick the right glassware, can they pick the right um, pick the right equipment for the experiment or, or the operating procedure? Can they prepare samples and solutions accurately? And identify suppliers of general lab equipment and lab chemicals. This one was interesting. This came from the occupational task assessment. It's one thing if the students can follow that procedure, but if they can't go out and figure out who is selling the reagents or selling the equipment, again, in Canada, many of our food companies are small and our graduates are often going out and quickly becoming the laboratory leaders um, it's daunting, but it's it, it's exciting at the same time. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that they understood what does it look like to go shopping for reagents in the chemical lab? How do you, er, who are those suppliers in Canada? How do you go about doing that? That was an important learning objective. Now, experiment on a variety of foods to perform routine quality. So now we're going back to that granular level. So what are those routine assessments that are done Time and time again, and we want to make sure we're introducing early enough. So analyze food products for pH, moisture, water activity. We know that those are absolutely uh, critical in most um, in most food plants. There's some one of those. Analyze a food product using spectrophotometry. So a wide variety of different um, uh, chemical analyses are reliant on spectrophotometry. So uh, some sort of color change with a reagent to measure vitamin content or protein content. Analyze a food using uh, titration. So we're again, we're at that granular level of some basic chemistry skills. It's up to the instructor to build out that relevance to a food system. So in the case of titration, I know our, our chemistry professor, Dr. Sunan Wang, is doing uh, vitamin C titration. And so that's a, that's a really nice one, but uh, sodium could be one or titratable acidity. Any sort of context where you're learning that titration, but then building out the relevance to food products that are commonly seen in, in the Canadian context, well, that's important too. Create and analyze a standard curve for measuring concentration. Well, that, that one's fun. I've got two, two verbs in there, but both are at the same level. Analyze a food's texture using a viscometer. So again, we've got really, um, we've got a, a nice number of different learning or elements of performance, pardon me. And what's really great is that these can be tr easily converted into laboratory exercises that are um, CBET centered so that the students are in there and actually doing these activities. And the nice thing is when we're building out this course outline, we need to think about how many of these um, learning objectives or elements of performance are there so that we can then they say, well, our course is 44 hours, let's say 40 hours by the time we've got some administration and evaluation time. But let's say we've got uh, 40 hours worth of time. How do we build out all of enough learning objectives to um, effectively use that 40 hours? 
And so oftentimes we'll say, well, is it broken out into uh, 14 weeks or 12 weeks? And do we have enough learning objectives to effectively um, pack that 12 weeks with lots and lots of good learning, but not overwhelm the students with so many learning objectives that it becomes impossible to have any sort of um, any sort of mastery on any of those learning objectives. Then uh, the last one I think was interpret data from chemical analyses using appropriate mathematics and computer applications. So that again was that mid-level um, that mid-level learning objective and now our elements of performance would include analyze unit conversions relevant to foods and chemical solutions using mathematics. So doing things like converting uh, moles to grams per liter or um, changing different metric to imperial units because that's very common in North America. Many of our equipment manufacturers are American and they're still using uh, U.S. imperial measurements, whereas in Canada we're still using metric. Manage data using relevant tables and graphs generated on a spreadsheet and perform basic linear regression analysis using a spreadsheet. So managing data, um, something that I think perhaps could have been articulated in this, and, and I realize this is, this is missing, but manage, manage laboratory notes. I think that's a learning objective that could be included in this in this course learning outcome because managing notes and experimental um, results I think is an important literacy skill for uh, food technologists. Now admittedly at this level they're likely not um, managing huge amounts of documentation but can they can they uh, take care of their notebook? Can they take care of the data using uh, laboratory management systems? Can they fill out templates appropriately to capture that data? That I think is a, uh, some, a learning objective that perhaps is missing. But I hope you saw now how we walk through and we're going through a very delineated process, breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. Now, what's interesting is now that we've got these elements of performance, you can say to your your, your curriculum designer, who's going to be thinking about the 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 classroom lesson, do each of these become granular lessons that we are doing or do they become threading themes that are actually integrated into every single lesson? So for example, manage dating using relevant tables and graphs generated on, this, on a spreadsheet. Do you need a whole lesson on that or are you demonstrating that skill every single time we're doing one of these? And so Oftentimes, uh, one of our next uh, slideshows is going to be talking about now how do we take these elements of performance and turn it into a teaching and learning plan or convert it into a lesson plan for a, for a classroom experience. And so it's okay, you can actually stack some of these learning uh, uh, elements of performance together into a, an experience. But the main thing is that now that you've got these elements of performance, you want to make sure that you are covering them at, at some point during the course and that you are also evaluating them in some form during that course. And that's going to be our next discussion in this series on um, curriculum design and, and better CBET teaching methodology. So Let's see where I'm at. Oh, you know what? I Because I had developed this for a previous workshop, we went through a whole pile of different courses. We've done one course. And feel free, if you if you have questions about developing learning objectives, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I realize this is not my normal Let's Learn Food Science content, but because many of my viewers are food science educators around the world, I think um, this has been really fun um, for me to add this sort of content. It's also informative for the students who are really, really eager beavers to uh, see why it is the way that I teach and why is it so different from some of the other instructors that they're, that they're working with. And for them to understand this is the process that makes for effective teaching, hopefully will impact on them um, in their future careers. They may be, they may be trainers in the establishments that they join or who knows maybe maybe 10 20 years from now some of these students end up uh, coming back to the the teaching profession as a subject matter experts at that point and they say you know what i i saw the value in teaching i want to i want to be that next generation teacher so so who knows where this is going to end up but i always love uh, just putting out knowledge uh, to share with you and i hope that you are enjoying this process as we go along feel free to ask questions and we'll talk to you again real soon